Apollo's tiny nipple should have been the title of this episode. <laughs> that that really should be it. <laughs> Captain Spot, Stardate 1561 74.1. Welcome aboard to Starships Enterprise, and thank you for joining us as we take a brief shore leave from the world of cinema sins to explore the universe of Star Trek. I'm your Captain Ian Whittington, and with me as always, she's the gamma that refuses to retire. It's Ambassador Danae. Hello. I have not retired. You're still here. I'm still here. What, is, what would be the difference between a gamma quadrant Danae and an alpha quadrant Danae? Mm, if they were going to mm-hmm. like go head to head. So one has been genetically manipulated, if I understand. They both last have, week. but oh, for different oh. reasons. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Because they both were bred. Yeah. But the alphas okay. were bred in the alpha quadrant because they can't mm-hmm. easily get to the gamma quadrant anymore. I immediately think about Austin Powers and like the the robot boobs. You know what I'm, <laughs> like, <laughs> that's the first thing that I thought <laughs> Cold open. That's amazing. Yeah, that's, that's the, the first, first thing I think of. That's the first of, augmentation yeah. that you would want. Yeah, I like a woman with that caliber. <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> I like that that's the top of your list. Yeah, yeah, I just assume... It's practical. That, well, they were bred for, like, battle and war. Yeah. So, you know... <laughs> Machine you gun like a, like They should have ro- had those. A robot come mm-hmm. onto the scene and then, you know, just guns coming right out of the titty. <laughs> But that would be that would be one of the versions. The yes. other version is the one that is more of like the mind battle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What would psychological be in your warfare yeah. or something? What would be in your little trouser pockets that you're so? I can't stop thinking about the gem. I I googled a full body image of the gem hadar and the pocket is right there. And there's like uh, an app game that has the gem hadar in it, and they have the little pocket as well. And it's such a big pocket, and I've never seen what goes in there. They're huge. Yeah. Big yeah, that's pocket. the question is like what the second evolution is. Gamma quadrant, alpha quadrant, whatever the quadrants are called. And I don't remember you got it. I Nailed it. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that the, the new evolution quadrant needs this pocket and mm-hmm. what is it for? Yeah, what goes in it? Snacks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, obviously drugs. <laughs> yeah. It's bullets for your boob tubes. <laughs> no, cuz that was the first version. This new version. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doesn't yeah, have yeah, boob yeah, yeah. tubes anymore. Yeah, but definitely snacks because that's the first step in any kind of psychological warfare is becoming friends with the person. Mm. And food, snack food is yeah. maybe Sharing the number snacks. one way to someone's heart. Just that the Kit Kat bar. That it's a be, Kit Kat bar. It's a Kit Kat. It would be super dark because they're manipulated by the Ketracel White. So then they would be manipulating the next person down by retaining a snack from them. So it would just be, it would make sense because it's a never ending cycle of have this nice thing and then do things for me or else you don't get the nice thing. This is how mice learn to run their little yeah, their little mazes. Yeah, that's how we run this enterprise. Okay, this week we are going back to the original series with season two, episode two, Who Mourns for Adonis? Based on Danae's Mind Palace predictions, uh, your prompts were uh, oranges slash fruit. Uh, right. Grecian garb is what yeah. you came up with. Mm-hmm. A courtyard, which was in the outtakes, not in the the main show, but I wanted to include it because it was like the courtyard is quite quite apt, and an open hand leading to a mystery slash who done it. Yeah, that's what I saw. Yeah, and I I think that I'm really nervous because of how the live chat reacted. The, to, the live chat got this. very excited about the open hand. Um, I and, think it was more than that because they were. <clears throat> it was. It was something about the. Um, oh, sorry. There like was the a, outdoor garden kind of thing that I saw. And a lilac dress. You saw a lilac dress as well, which is quite interesting. So I mean, it's I, it's, really strange. I yeah. understand, and it's hard to believe me. And I think we should just move on because yep. it's going to happen every time. Vulcans never bluff. Well, my first question before this is: Did Spock ever lie? Uh, yes, hundred oh. percent. Okay, well, then yeah. they, uh, that is, he it's would a call terrible it something example. Else. Yeah. Oh, well, what would he call it? He would say expanding upon the truth or not being entirely forthcoming. <laughs> he would find a way to mentally reconcile it. But did he always Using come clean code. about it? Huh? Did he come clean about it? Like, um, or... Not to the bad guy, because he would only ever lie to the bad guy. And okay. then he would tell... And then McCoy would be like, Spock, did I detect a lie? He said, no, Doctor, I merely expanded upon the truth as ah, I see it. Okay, okay, okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. But well, then I think I'm still in, I'm still in the Spock parameters then. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. I'm not, I'm not deceiving anybody. No, you're not. You are one. You're being more Vulcan than Spock is, and that's that's saying something. He's actually half human, so that's not difficult. Okay, before we get into the episode, let's do some emails. Emails. Okay, hailing frequencies open, everyone. It's time for us to read your emails from Discord, Twitter, and well, email. Um, couple of corrections from last week, which are always fun to do. Um, Emmanuel via email. Um, thank you for your email. Says. Uh, minor fix is the defiant was introduced in season three i think i said season four or five i couldn't quite remember um but yeah we were talking about how the defiant was introduced to kind of give them a bit more m- mobility and to introduce a little bit more starfleet into the show uh, we were talking about bashir and how he was um genetically augmented from birth and we were talking about when they introduced that and they introduced it late in the show but i forgot that bashir the character knew all along but the actors and the writers didn't decide it until like season five or six. Oh, so the character then has to say yeah i knew all along but i deliberately played dumb so that i wouldn't be exposed because suddenly once he's exposed he's doing all of these calculations in his head and it, <laughs> like that's a great reminder emmanuel thank you but it's like it's so messed up because how many people died because he had to play dumb like, was there a time when he had the knowledge to fix something or to solve a problem, but couldn't because he was hiding? And that's the problem when you retcon things, is that every action he has leading up until that point, you then look at with a different lens. Because it's like, oh, you knew that you were super smart and stronger or whatever. Right. But the actor doesn't and the writers does don't. So there's no way they were working that into the story oh interesting and I, that's why it like angered fans so much and it angered uh, okay. the actor too that makes sense it's wild to think about though isn't it like it's such a huge retcon to do yeah and you have to wonder why they decide to do it like the risk of changing something yeah for the for the art of the story like it must have been really important to them for some reason mm-hmm. at least i hope it was instead of yeah. a i don't know <laughs> we want to do this for fun we've run out of ideas yeah that would mm-hmm. suck um and yeah Emmanuel finishes the email with love what you guys are doing Um, also these light-hearted episodes of ds9 even though it's the darkest series and has the darkest episodes is where cisco and kira really shine the most yeah and i think i like their their i think the banter didn't hit you quite right but for like when you've seen the whole show all together it's fun to see them loosen up and to be um be a bit more jovial with each other well, that's one thing that we keep seeing over and over again in these yeah. uh, episodes, and we and I kind of like that we almost hit on it regularly. Is to us these are yeah. really damaging moments, and to them it's just a Tuesday afternoon. <laughs> and it is. I I kind of forget, like I'm watching it, going, "This is really major," but I have to remember that these are people who live in this universe yeah. where the things that are happening to them are normal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is just totally you're going to be shrunk this is for science yeah. it's totally normal so they're just like laughing about it because somehow they know that engineering is going to do something incredible and they're going to save the day um leading on from that we have a message on the discords from josh who put together this very articulate note that i love um something i feel that captain ian has not explained to the ambassador is that avery brooks the actor who plays cisco and this is in regards to you not connecting with cisco last episode um is that avery brooks is from another planet anyone who has ever had a conversation with mr brooks can attest to what a truly unique individual he is um he definitely marches to the beat of his own drummer avery brooks doesn't even hear a drum and will march on his hands if he feels like it i've met him a few times and every time he's just something else it's like dealing with a person who is on hallucinogens but didn't actually take the drugs Uh, once he answered a question by smiling walking off stage getting a tambourine and then returning with the tambourine, pounding on it while spinning, and then saying, next? Question mark. And by the way, the question was something normal for a Star Trek convention audience, not can you smile and go get a tambourine and spin around. <laughs> His personality brings a lot of nuance to the character of Cisco, um, but some poor soul definitely had to rein him in. Um, but much of his true nature is an untethered being bleeds in through Cisco. And I can attest to that having met him as well. He is a space cadet in the best way possible. This man it has already evolved to whatever the next plane of existence humans go to. He's already there and is slumming it with us. 
in his off hours. Like he is watching him as Cisco as a human being is so interesting when Avery Brooks is not a human being. <laughs> like we should watch an interview of him together and you'll you'll get what what I mean. Yeah. That's I- interesting. Because there mm-hmm. are some personalities that, you know, you're hired for something because you have a quirky personality. Yeah, you don't have to act much. It's not a big reach. Right. Which if if that's the case, then I think that might be part of the charm of watching Cisco. Mm-hmm. And I did evolve a bit as the show progressed or as our, our show progressed. Mm-hmm. And I was kind of digesting more. Um, yeah, absolutely. Like we had a good talk about why he's acting the way he's acting. There's such a there's such an amount of bravery in doing the show this way because it's just the yeah. gut reaction versus mm-hmm. the thoughtful like I've had two days to do research and and no I've one was read coming blogs. at you yeah no one was coming at you saying you're a dick but that is it a wasn't good... quite as bad as hating on Judzia that was a big one yeah <laughs> but you deserve that um, but the, this is some really important context because I think Avery Brooks might be the best actor ever because Cisco is not. It, from what I've seen, is not him. Like it's really, it's a really interesting performance. Uh, and then one final email from Rima seventy eight. This was just to say that the, the uh, Rima actually sent in some some measurements and schematics of the Captain Kirk's Enterprise compared to the Defiant. Because I said off the top of my head that the Defiant is roughly the same size as the saucer section of Captain Kirk's Enterprise, and I was right. I was off by about five meters. <laughs> Wow. Nerd! Nerd! So thank you, Rima, for making me feel incredible about that off the cuff gut instinct um <laughs> comparison in size. That probably doesn't matter because I don't think you really know how big Kirk's Enterprise is compared to anything else. But No, no, no. But <laughs> you're doing this show in front of other super fans. Yeah. I can't even imagine I get to be like, I don't know, you know, but you have to <laughs> You gotta come to the table like prepared. Yeah, and I I love that the message the message came in, and I was like, wait, does this mean I was right? And I'm like, you're off by about ten meters, but that's okay. (laughs) That's forgivable. That's That's forgivable. I love that. Well, we love hearing your emails. We love getting your corrections. Um, Thank you for um, sending in your stuff. We still have a backlog that we haven't got through yet. So if you haven't heard your email, do not worry; it will appear on a future episode. Um, But yeah, send in anything you like, any questions to uh, CaptainSpot at CinemaSins.com. Um, or the other best place is on discord.gg slash cinemasins. Okay, Ambassador, with that, you ready to watch some TOS? I'm ready, Captain. I, I'm going to be watching you for one particular moment that appears and and just watch your mind be blown. We'll see you in 10 forward for a full debrief as we head over to the holodeck to watch um, season two, episode two of the original series, Who Mourns for Adonis? Two to be out. <laughs> Welcome to 10 Forward, the part of the show where we grab something from the replicator and share our immediate thoughts and feelings on the episode we just watched together. Most important question first, what would you like before you tell me how much you hated this episode? <laughs> um, yeah, let's just go with some ambrosia. Oh, some ambrosia? Nice. Um, I want some awkward 60s stereotypes, please. <laughs> um, hey, Danae, at what point are you going to leave this enterprise? Um, and then I'm just going to lose an officer because you found a man. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Give us a synopsis. Please be kind. This is this was not what I was expecting. No, I honestly, I forgot everything about this episode other than the green hand and Apollo. <laughs> I remember nothing. I remember the courtyard, Apollo, yep. great performance from Apollo, green hand, done, it, nothing. And this opens rough. <laughs> Rough. Yeah, we're gonna get into the the uncomfortable, the good, the bad. I think the synopsis is um that the Enterprise um is captured by a being that has already encountered human civilization on Earth five thousand years ago, mm-hmm. and one remains of choice, uh, named Apollo who has been sitting on this planet just waiting for humans to come across him at some point in the future and has just been hoping someday to have worshipers and get some faith and juice. he forces uh he's attempting to force them to love him through exerting dominance um even unto the only female uh that they brought along on their away team yeah and- he could have fallen in love with kirk 
And then they break free by destroying the source of Apollo's power and are able to escape the dominating Apollo, who the show wants us to believe is somehow a potentially redeemable loving father figure. I mean, I could make a point. I could I could I could make an argument. Um yeah, the the, the crux of the episode is humans have evolved beyond their gods and the last holdout to um to 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 that idea is Apollo who has been waiting on Pollux for for the eventual arrival uh, time that humans will find him. Yeah, exactly. So, overall thoughts and feelings about this episode. Did you have a good time? I, I'm pretty sure you, you you did not, but was there anything redeeming from it that you could take away? There's always going to be a downshift in pacing because... Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This episode is... It, it, I don't like Apollo, the character, mm. right? Like the one that we yeah, just saw. Not, I don't think we're supposed to. Don't, no. don't like him. No. Nope. And he dominates the screen. Um, And, and he is... Literally. Repetitive, repetitive... Uh, there's not really like an evolution of his character. It's just love me, fear me, love me, fear me, love me, fear me, but in different, like, he just says it over and over again. So if you have a pie chart, a bigger portion of this, of this episode is Apollo talking about his need to be adored. Yeah. And I, and I didn't enjoy his character. Um, mm -hmm. Although I think it's an interesting idea to have an alien species that, came across earth 5000 years ago yeah. and that the entire like greek history um is based on an actual physical like relationship with these gods now i have to say it was really interesting to watch this having been uh, ha being a lore olympus fan and i think i've talked mm. about this before but it's been a long time so i just want to take a quick moment so um Lore Olympus is a webcomic series that is on the app uh, Webtoon, and I followed it from the first time it launched, and it's just wrapped up. It's done now. Oh, it's finished. Oh, that's it. I've, yeah, I've heard you talk about this for years. It's a really, really fascinating look at specifically Hades and Persephone's relationship. That's kind of like... Mm through the lens of those two and Apollo is in obviously this one um because Apollo plays a role and it's really interesting because all these different mythologies there's different kind of versions in a way but the fans of Lore Olympus in the comment section anytime a new character would pop up would be like oh I know what's about to happen you know because because they get these it. stories yeah. have been written but it's uh the author is Rachel Smith or Smythe and she is, um, I'm sure she's taking some creative license with the storytelling. The art is fantastic. Uh, and I could talk about this particular series for far too long. And that's not why we're here. So I'll kind of move forward. But because I have been in Laura Olympus brain for years, literally every week, rushing to see what the next episode is going to be. Mm. I fucking hate Apollo. I hate him. Like he. Wait, this version or in general? Just, all Laura Olympus. Of Apollo? Like right. any any kind of th before Lore Olympus, it was like, oh Apollo, he's some god. Yeah, he's a god. Fine. But seeing him here and and that's the representation of his character here, I am triggered. Yeah. That's amazing. That's so interesting. I couldn't have predicted that. Yeah, that's because so interesting. Apollo, you know, it, the whole idea of gods and not it was not just Apollo, like Zeus and all of these gods. Yeah. They they took women they were their playthings. humans were their playthings yeah. essentially lucky human you get to be with yeah. me you should be thankful so so this was us watching like manipulation happening and that's really uncomfortable <laughs> yeah super uncomfortable yeah. Spe for me it's extra uncomfortable how quickly lieutenant carolyn goes along with it like I think that's the weakest the weakest part of the episode for me is she is immediately all in, which does no service to to womankind. She's just, I love him. I'm in. This is amazing. How could I say no to this man? Kirk's weak ass argument happens and it works, and she turns and is like, Oh yeah, no, I'm a human. Screw you. That's fine. Like I'll sacrifice for my crew. And then she's sobbing. All in the space of like an hour. It's interesting. Like that's the weakest bit for me. I don't buy any part of her character. But you say that, you know, it's not really doing a service to womankind, but in this era, 
what did we expect her to do? Because women were well, expect- designed mm-hmm. in the in our social structures to be submissive. Like like mm-hmm. if we had put, no, you're not wrong if we had put Danae no. in that moment, <clears throat> I'd be like, Hell yeah. Let me just play into this for a minute. I'll be right back with his balls in my hand. Not the good way. Like the it takes five pounds of pressure to twist and pull them off kind yes. of a way, right? Like I would go <laughs> yes. in Go going, you know what? Just give me a minute. I'm gonna let this go yeah. a little further, and that way I can get close and just rip this thing out of his chest. Like I would be. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. The god organ. You know, but she. I, I didn't know what she was doing at first. I thought maybe she was going along with it because she was going to be gathering information. But when she well, comes, Kirk seems to think that as well. Yeah. When she comes back and she's like, "I'm in love." I got the impression that maybe they were like kissing a little bit at first and then he promises her this goddess hood and maybe that's whenever they have sex and then she's just like maybe like you know he could have used his powers yeah. to make it real real good and just kind of fucked her brain up we all we've all had really <laughs> it's uh, all happened let me just yeah. say this again this is not a kid's podcast please stop listening uh, the hope is is that in your lifespan you would have had great sex at least once Mm-hmm. And it does kind of make you do stupid shit sometimes. Soupy brain. Yeah, yeah, you get soupy brain. That's a great way to put it. <laughs> there you go. And so she comes out in the state and I'm like, I've been there before. I know that face. <laughs> and it's also hard because I understand, too, that she's like, oh, he's he's nice. There's something that's redeemable about this care, this person. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, let's let's just like see how this goes. But it's such an extreme because what he wants is to dominate destroy their ship take all of their people down to the planet hey go get your crew bring them all over with their shovels we're starting over from scratch like you're gonna love me as a god and and it's such a selfish thing because there's nothing in it for the crew like he thinks that his love for them will be enough right yeah that's satisfying because apollo is delusional yeah so it is hard for me to kind of go oh was it a hard like was it a stretch for her so she was just i feel like in that moment like taught like uh, tugged back and forth between is there a way to save us all kind of a vibe and kirk rightfully is like pull your shit together like we're yeah. we're gonna be slaves if you give him the yeah, ability to make a slave just met. and yeah. what i liked is that the next scene with them she didn't say i'm a human she said i'm a scientist Yes, and I like that, that I part. do like. I w- just I wish that had been her plan all along. I do too. And I know that robs some power from Kirk, but fuck him. Like that fine. Like he he'll, he'll have other moments. Like but that clearly wasn't her plan from the beginning. So no. it's such a big swing to go from love 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 to I'm a scientist, which is like that's kind of where I would like her to be. Yeah. In this situation. Like that is her specialty, but she immediately falls quote unquote falls in love i don't think that there is a way for the writers to have given her that power when this was created i think this is their attempt at giving her some authority like we even yeah. saw her save the day and inadvertently undermining the captain's plan you know by, by saying like no please don't hurt everybody like a father wouldn't hurt his children you know stop and the captain's just like god damn it ah, Caroline. Shit. i wanted one of us to get Caroline, her <laughs> Car- Caroline, whatever Car- Carolyn. Carolyn. Yeah. Palamas. Yeah. So I, I I mean her whole thing was uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. This is an uncomfortable episode, but it kicks off from the very beginning uncomfortably. Like for me, maybe I can understand like you're face to face with a god. He's talking cool and he has mind powers he has powers and maybe you think like okay i'll be the goddess and uh, maybe i'll help save everybody by taking on this role maybe she kind of just was in her own head as some sort of like captive because she was captive but but it starts off with a man saying you look a bit tired you know so right at the beginning of this episode <laughs> we have some worse. we have some things that's just like man how time i'm so glad times have changed but it's hard to watch how what like what women are portrayed as in TOS, and it always will be. It really but, is, because, but it is it's part of our American history. It, it really is, and uh, and English history as well. Uh, that that cold open gets from awkward to worse to holy shit! I want to change the episode that we're watching because yeah, it was McCoy uncomfortable. McCoy does the "you look tired" thing, and they they do say that to men as well, but. It has a different connotation yeah. when you present it to the only woman, or 
one of the only two women on the bridge like the way there is a more patronizing tone to it and i want to be as kind as possible because there's a chance that this scene is written deliberately over the top because of what's coming next in the rest of the episode like this wasn't a throwaway conversational thing the focus is on carolyn because of the role that she has to play later on in the episode as well so mccoy uh, scotty seduces her and they, they agree to go for coffee mccoy says well this happens to all of the women in the service eventually they find a man they get pregnant and then we lose an officer and kirk's like yeah i'm gonna lose an officer doesn't it suck that women fall in love and get pregnant and that i mean they didn't say so... it quite like that but that's but that's no, what they were saying those are the exact words that i heard <laughs> and, <laughs> and all of that like that just isn't a random throwaway cold open that ties into oh they're actually gonna lose carolyn because she finds the ultimate man yeah. and falls in love yeah. so I have maybe 1% forgiveness because it's relevant to the episode, but 99% of me is, it's such a stereotype it's really stere- to play into. It's so yeah. stereotypical yeah. and not at all the case. <laughs> right, like, like That was the perception. That Yeah. It's like this is why we don't have women in the workplace because they're going to get pregnant and it's unreliable. Like There was, the, there was also yeah. the line like, on the other hand, she's a woman. And she's all woman. And it's just like, <laughs> wow. 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 So I don't know. It just it was very degrading. And then at the same like or even just like, come along, dear. It goes against for me what Star Trek is is it at its heart, which is equality and uh and uh, opportunity for everybody and give everybody a chance. And we've evolved in the future at this point to be not (sighs) to be blind to that in in as much as what it allows you to do. Like you remember the history and where we came from. But everybody has the opportunity to do what to do what anybody wants to do. And even Kirk's argument where he's like, you're a human and we're always going to be human. That doesn't feel very Star Trek. Because what about Spock's parents? Yeah. Who is a human and a Vulcan? Like, it isn't about being human. It's about being a living organism. Like, that's the thing that you should respect. Like, that's not the argument he should be making against them being together. It should be that you are being manipulated right now by a very powerful creature Mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if you're human vulcan klingon right you are being manipulated and the the consequence of that is going to be all of your colleagues being enslaved and another way that they kind of telegraph that carolyn is really susceptible to this ruse is like when he changes her clothes she doesn't go what the fuck dude yeah she says oh it's beautiful you know she just immediately really enjoys her clothing even though he just said you seem wise for a woman for a woman and it's like wow like like we are just lesser beings and we're just grateful to be on screen and that is just kind of how it is but you're right the 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 tone of star trek that we hear and we hope for and we see now more boldly in our content thankfully is a representation of race, religion, sexual orientation, and you know, and I, I, all of it. All of it's there. We're yeah. we're able to kind of see more representation, which is nice. But Kirk has a moment with her towards the end, whenever he you know gets her back on their side, where he does talk about equality, and so it's like it's in there, and it's in there enough that I feel like the show thinks that it's redeemed itself. But the damage is done. The little girl watching this in this when this came out Shouldn't be. <laughs> is watching it going, oh, so if a man says worship me and I'll make you my goddess, even though I'm a scientist, if I have pretty clothes, I should go along with it. Right. Like there's it just, kind of does. Yeah. Because I buy that Apollo is saying that because as much as we're being a bit judgmental about how stuff was in the 60s, which like star trek was doing the best that it could Mm -hmm. like cultural stuff is going to evolve that's where they were at in the 60s apollo is five thousand years before that so i'm not even judging apollo for having that point of view because from his perspective as his god species they the humans were pets and that is how that's that is how they saw men women everybody but it's her reaction that's damaging. Yeah, like, it it's is. her yeah. reaction to it. Not saying, oh, wow, I'm glad I don't live in those times anymore. She just is along for the ride in the pretty dress. And and when we, and we'll, we'll get to the next, like, other stuff here, too. Like, it's not, there's more to talk about that wasn't mm-hmm. ho- horrible. But this is, I mean, this was the, <laughs> this was the hardest part, I feel, of, of this show. When we do get to the part where she is standing up for him, because of how they've placed her on the screen and they've showed us her story, 
I don't know if I believe that she is saying that I can't love you any more than I would love a new species of bacteria, which is a great slam if she believed it. I just don't know if she had and like... I don't think she does. Had, yeah, the, the show didn't telegraph that to us very well in that if there was an aha moment with Kirk, it was played reluctantly as if it was like, okay, I guess I'll go tell my new sex buddy that I can't be his plaything anymore, you know, instead yeah. of it being... There's like, nothing that Apollo does to push her that way it's all based on kirk's pretty flimsy speech and that seems to be all that we right that's enough for her that's to suddenly change yeah. yeah and maybe and maybe it was and it's just like it wasn't enough for me to think okay she's she's on board you know and then we do see her uh, like in this uh danger situation where he imposes himself on her which i don't know if that was meant to be uh, like an assault on her obviously it's a physical yeah, assault so. on her but it looked like it was also like mental and emotional and it was this part of this dominating uh, like, like his whole thing is i i'm gonna discipline you until you love me that's his whole thing yes so th- and i'm gonna get big that moment that he you know grows in size and then calls forth the storm sort of before the end um like the big climax of this one even that when she comes out of it it's played just like you would expect in tos times of this kind of just like damsel in distress um scotty to the rescue yeah scotty let me help you lay your head down on this rock my dear and i i just didn't buy what her role was in it we don't even see her uh, you know there's not like a moment where she's back on the enterprise like back in her power as a scientist going like hey Thank you for helping me, you know, break out of that spell or anything that kind of gave us an indication that she wasn't fully aware of her choices. So, yeah, very, very interesting episode when you think about how this woman is portrayed, how her choices are portrayed and putting her uh, in that opposite role of Apollo, this dominating God, you know, it was really uncomfortable, but interesting. I would love to be, yeah, I would love to be in the writer's room for it. Like, what was the goal with Carolyn? Like, what were they trying to say with her character? Was it the weakness of women? Was it that she can, she has the ability to choose? Like, what was the story you were trying to put it, put across? Or was it just to make Kirk look really clever? Because Kirk is the most, like, logical and kind of relatable character in this whole episode he's keeping scotty in check he has the um the breakthrough about maybe this is apollo let's not dismiss it maybe he is a god as we would perceive it back then and he talks carolyn through what's happening and comes up with the final plan like he's our he's our kind of moral center and i just would love to know what the intent was yeah for her what well, do, what are you trying to tell us with her how different is this episode if the away team didn't bring a woman because apollo didn't ask for a woman to come right? down they just happened to bring her because well plot convenience but um so so like what what is this episode if if they had gone down without a woman that would have attracted apollo you know because that's i mean what is it saying about men you know that they see a woman and then their plans are gone so yeah. it's not yeah. just an assault on women it truly is this like approach to how men and women interact mm-hmm. that makes me uncomfortable because yeah. I know that it is a it's a trope for a reason, you know. Mm-hmm. I don't know. There's just so much that's occurred and I don't really want to go obviously into all of the details of it, but this is a glimpse of what the writers felt like this sh- the episode needed and I think that that's really interesting that they're like, okay, so Apollo is going to be tempted by this woman and she's going to be his downfall. Yeah, right, but, Adam and Eve. Mm-hmm, she's going to be his downfall, um, but she's not going to get there on her own. She has to get there because of the man's idea. And That extra organ was a rib. She's going to, yeah, exactly. <laughs> she's going to go along with it, but, you know, she really loves him. Um, mm-hmm. But you know what? She's okay. She she wants to, she wants to you know, serve her captain. And none of it was really her own agency. And that was that was hard to watch uh, yeah, for me. I love that I'm a scientist line, but you're right. It doesn't save much. It doesn't mean that she had agency. It kind of, I don't no. know. Anyway. What's <laughs> interesting is, you just made, you just tweaked my brain about this, is that Kirk's plan, if she's not there on the away mission, his plan is maybe you kill three of us, but one of us and the crew will survive if we take you out. So it's muscle, it's brawn. The female plan is heart and appealing to this this fatherly motherly vibe 
and that's the that's the dichotomy between the two and that's the trope isn't it that the the men are all brains and muscle yeah. and then the women are more nurture and she nurtures a solution out of him and then takes that nurture away and i think ultimately the idea again of this like alien species is really interesting and that's fun yeah um but also the the show does this strange thing at the end where it attempts to and i'm going to use the word humanize uh apollo and kind of like he cries and we're feeling bad i didn't feel bad for him at all but like i think the show is wanting to telegraph that like oh you know sometimes people do bad things for a good reason and yeah and then it ends with kirk with kirk kind of basically going i guess we could have gotten him some leaves and maybe could we have maybe killed a single tear would it have hurt us to gather a few laurel leaves like they gave so much they they, what we had in our golden age was it it all came from a place of worship would it have hurt us to gather a few laurel leaves and the answer is that's yes, he, it would yes, have hurt. That's not what he wanted. But yeah, he didn't want a few laurel leaves. All of them, any, forever, Any all time. sign of uh, submission to this alien creature that wants to s- enslave you. Mm-hmm. I-, I liked that Kirk was trying to like fight his way back. I liked that he was standing up to him. I, I- it was curious. And let's talk about that. Yeah. Like yeah. This alien creature's powers. Let's talk about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's the most interesting part of the episode for me that the the gods came from an alien species. Because for me, that's very appealing. Like, if um, if if all of our stuff, all of our stories, Bibles, religious texts, if they all come from factual events, which they don't have to, it's interesting that it was an alien species that visited us, appeared to be gods, and then left. And trying to put some science behind. His powers, they do a really fun job of explaining why he's the only god left and what happened to the other gods. They basically gave up waiting to be worshipped and ascended to live their lives differently. And Apollo is the last remaining holdout. Like, I think that's that's really interesting. And it's I, I love to hear your thoughts as well. Yeah, I mean, I do have my own like personal beliefs. And like, Kirk even says like, we don't need lots of gods. We only need one. I was like, oh, oh there's man. the Christian line. There we go. <laughs> that hurt me I, so much. I looked it's over at so... you and I was like, oh, how did that feel? <sighs> um, it's such a product of the, of the 60s. <laughs> yeah. 60s but it, listening to it today feels so contradictory because I was like, we don't need gods. We've moved beyond them. We, we only need, need one. one. <laughs> just, just the one. Um, but i do like that they say scotty doesn't believe in gods so there is like some an acknowledgement that like i'm fine that humans still believe in a god or whatever happens in the 2400s it's it's nice that scotty is there as well as the atheist like it's it's interesting i really wasn't thinking about my own belief system in this i was mostly thinking Mm. about like uh, this alien because we have a physical being that can also uh teleport or shift into a different I couldn't tell if they were going into a different realm or if he was just moving them onto a different part of the planet. Yeah, I think it's that. But I think it was moving. It's basically a transport. Because she kind of walked back. So she's so she wasn't. So she, yeah, so he's teleporting. He says he can create life and death. He says he can create whatever he wants. Um, he has a, a different organ in his body. Actually, my favorite part of this episode is when they first land. And he's like talking all this like Olympian jargon. Mm-hmm. Oh, thou thou have come to wash up me. Like he's doing all this stuff, and then just cuts over to uh, Bones, I think. Yeah. And he's just kind of like scanning. He's like, brruh, brruh, brruh. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> and like it, keep talking. This is just, great. Yeah, Good it shit. was so great because he was so non. He wasn't phased by it at all. He wasn't really like listening. He was just like, okay, this is an interesting reading, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it, this is weird. It did that like three times, I think, just enough for me to know that I think the show knew that it was being. Fun funny because i that was the only humor i found in this entire episode oh 100 um, even a little, little bit moment. of banter with like kirk and chekhov i'm like how old are you i'm 22 well, i should handle this right all of that just felt really patronizing as well yeah um but the alien part was really curious that no it had to have a source that of power so then they had to have built it because they once did it on Earth, so this structure he it's not like that structure came on this planet. So Yeah, they had to build it there. Yeah, so they built this sort of power thing that can like em- emanate in a pulse faction and then through his organ he can channel it. Mm-hmm. I mean that sounds pretty cool. Like this is an- It's really cool. It's a cool bit of logic for how the gods work. This is on the border of what I would consider a creature episode. Just like mm. a like an evil yes. weird creature that yeah. you don't expect. And yeah. we recently were watching um TNG and there was another one that I was like this is a creature episode and it's when mm. um 
Riker and some of the crew are yeah, being... Yeah, it was schisms that were being kidnapped. Are, yeah, they're being abducted into this other, like, teeny tiny little... Yeah, and then, then they go into the... With the ticks. The holodeck, and then they recreate the, like, little... Like the, We've and, been in this room before. We all have. Yeah. Yeah, with the little pincers. So, so I would put this one in, like, the middle ground area because mm. this is... A, a creature this is yeah, not a human alien creature yeah. yeah and he is scary now he looks like a human but they even said that he could change his form early on like yeah, Kirk kind of alluded yeah. to that and mccoy was like he looks human but what does that mean <laughs> like we see human looking aliens all the time right exactly <laughs> Depends what the makeup department wants to do that week that's what i liked about this episode let's talk about yeah. that i liked that they were attempting to keep it in the scientific realm where yes. we're talking about the biology of this creature. We're talking about its powers. We're talking about like, sort of like, yeah, we've seen this kind of thing before. Um, he could call forth, you know, lightning, but he could also choke you out like force style. Yeah. And he just obliterated their phasers, stopped their communications. He was holding on to a ship. Like this was a very powerful alien and his downfall was that he wanted someone to like pander to his ego all day long. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he has a limit. Like there is a limit to his powers, which is like Q, as far as I know, has no limit. It was. It's more interesting for me when I can still believe he's a god in comparison to like what humans can do. Right. Like without any kind of support or a ship behind us. But he has a limit to his powers. Like at telling the Enterprise to stop and firing lightning up to it wiped him out. He couldn't, there was a limit to what he could do. Right. And I, yeah, I love the science behind, okay, what would a god actually look like? How could they still be godlike, but still have some limitations to them as well? And I thought that the cinematography to kind of build up the tension was really good too. That finale is great. It was That's really intense. The score, him shouting, stop, like I bought that like that made me feel things at the end that's really I, good finale i did too and i and, and even when they were reflecting so he uh apollo had already kind of given up the ghost and gone transparent forever i guess i don't know um and take me <laughs> and take then me, Zeus. our crew is standing in the rubble going god i kind of wish we didn't have to to do that and i like that thought i do too the idea that to survive we had to ruin something yeah and wouldn't it be great if there was another way um but but diplomacy was clearly not an option no because he had said that once the crew comes down he was going to squish the ship and mm -hmm. you kind of believe that he would do it too because he was fucking crazy <laughs> yeah he doesn't care he was crazy i think that that leads nicely onto michael forrest who is the actor that played apollo I think he's great. Whatever you think of Apollo, he is incredible in this episode. Like, I buy him as a god. Me too. His, yeah. like, Greek delivery of stuff was great. His passion at the end when he's throwing those lightning bolts up. He was the, his tear. His little tear, which may or may not be real. But the emotion good. he was portraying was still great. Take me back, Zeus. I'm so I'm sorry, my friends. I fucked this up. I Michael Forrest is the highlight of this episode. He's so so good as Apollo. I kind of wish they brought him back in like oh, one of the movies. As I'm back, I brought the gods with me. I'm pissed. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great oh, movie. Man. Let's do that. Yeah, I didn't like I said earlier. I'm not going to repeat myself too much. I just felt like the dialogue was wash, rinse, repeat. Yeah, it didn't really go deeper than him no you know his weakness was that he was horny and <laughs> that was yep. it mm -hmm. horny for faith and actual horny yeah it's in it's one of the episodes that would be better as 35 to 40 minutes like there's 15 minutes of repeat dialogue there's there's an entire like there's scenes that could just be cut from this because there's scotty getting beaten up again like that that's we get it like you're not going to convince him yeah. and th he's not going to convince the crew to stay behind. Yeah. Yeah. It, and also, like, I do like his performance, but this is an uncomfortable one. I can't imagine who I would recommend this episode to. And I keep kind of coming back to that in my mind. Um, Aside from going into this thinking that this is a nasty creature, like, we're going to watch a really disturbing creature. Like, that, that would be the only reason I feel... And maybe, and I'm curious if the audience, like if you guys listening at home, you know, you're like, oh, this is who I would recommend this to. 
it mm. it is it's sometimes it's a good idea to go back and watch stuff that makes you feel uncomfortable and and kind of you know ask questions but even at the end he's so manipulative that after hurting everybody choking them out trying to kill them threatening their lives forcing himself onto people and physically emotionally he makes her feel worse by saying I loved you and I would have made a goddess out of you and I opened my heart to you look what you've done to me yeah and as someone who's been in emotionally manipulative Mm -hmm. relationships before that kind of shit is the kind of stuff that you like you you can't argue with someone like Apollo. No, he's already lost, and he's still trying to hurt her- you. Like, there's nothing to gain. This is just to hurt exactly. her. Exactly, and and that's the thing that's weird about this episode is that yes, it's a great performance, but it's like when you watch something in a movie and you're like, ooh, that kid's a little too close to home. I've been in too many yeah, I, fucked yeah. up relationships to appreciate that kind of a person, but I do that's agree fair. that he did a great job of acting, mm. and he does make a return in there's a fan series called star trek continues which is like borderline between fan made and actually approved by paramount like they they were before a lot of like the fan guidelines came into place and the same actor actually returns i think this is in the noughts they made this um and he returns in a follow-up episode which is which is quite interesting I think before we move on to, yeah. I want to say like what I enjoyed about the Enterprise in this episode. Oh, please. I was not moving on until we talked about the Green Hand. <laughs> okay, well, let's talk about the Green Hand first and then talk the about hand. the Enterprise. This is one of the most iconic images in all of TOS history. That Green Hand holding the Enterprise. Like, it's just such a bizarre image. And it's so great. And like, people cosplay at, it at conventions pretty much every year. It's so it's funny. such a fun image. And the way the crew reacts to it as well is perfect. It's not like this is Tuesday. It's this is weird, guys. That's a hand. And it's coming That's a hand off coming the at planet, the planet, getting closer. Yes. It's going to grab us. And it, it does. It just, boop, just grabs his little <laughs> yep. hand. Like it's me getting a new Starship model. Like, there we go. This is mine now. It's so great. I love it. It's so memorable. Yeah, that was really fun. I mean, the graphics in this one were interesting. Like, you've got the lightning going on. You've got um, Apollo sort of transparently getting, like, uh, that in that scene at the end where he's, like, transparent mm. against the background just to kind of show yes. his power. You had him in space, just his head in space. Um, that was an interesting graphic. You had him growing in size, which was fun. Really well done. That was yeah. really clever because really cool. you know, the camera pans up and they're looking up at the camera and you're like, whoa, he's growing, huh? And then, yep, we're just looking right up his golden skirt and he's this <laughs> yeah, huge, everywhere. huge god. So Massive god dog. The graphics are really, really fun in this one. I really... It's really great. Um, we were watching the remastered version, so um, I'm showing you a picture right now, which is the original image oh, that it would wow. look like. Was so it black it's... and white? The po- no, there is some color in there, but it doesn't pop anywhere near as much as the remastered um, version. It doesn't even show. So, oh, again, wow. That might be a better image, actually. Yeah. Is that the original? or? That's the original. And oh, then I this see. is the new one that we saw. Oh, okay. Go back to the... Um, oh, man. That's interesting. So that's what the hand looked like. Just yeah. Literally a human hand. <laughs> so did you notice, and this might have been the remastered, I'm not sure, but when they were eventually able to fire phasers, it actually... like. They took out part of the hand so that yes. the phasers had a clear path. That was really clever. Yeah, really, really clever. I don't really know clever. if they did that in the original. I, don't know if the original. I doubt it. But um, and when he's just dest- when they when the Enterprise is destroying the Apollo's um, Parthenon thing, uh, that's what it looks like in the new um, one. And then this is what it looked like originally. Oh my god, that's so different. That. Okay, so in the I original, it. it is just the pavilion. Yeah, and then two red highlight markers squeeze yep. like squeegee yep. down just touching it it just looks like somebody drew on the screen yeah but then just a felt tip pen. in the one we did it was very different it was bright lights with a shining edge and then the pavilion mm-hmm. slowly got red as it, it like heated up yeah wow that's so different really interesting i feel yeah, so really, lucky to really watch the remastered changes. I wonder how I'd feel about it if i wasn't watching the remastered i wish we were watching the og honestly i really do like there's something in my brain that breaks a bit when I see this more updated green hand. It's fun though. Versus the the, the, the janky glowy but one from the cool OG. what a Because you know, I think you want to make it somewhat interesting, and it's not so over the top that no. I would feel that it's taking away from the original series. No, I don't think you would have known. No, had I, did, I, I didn't. Had I not yeah. told you, which I think is That's kind good. of a gift. Actually, I do too. it's kind yeah. of good. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, I really enjoyed the Enterprise in this one. There's a yes. there's so much to enjoy. Spock is in the captain's chair. Yeah, he is. He's in charge. He's so fun to watch. Yeah, like he's great when he's in charge. I he love has it. this mega clipboard. Yeah. Oh, it's big. And yeah, yeah, yeah. When he tells the blue eyed guy. Oh, um, Riley, to, Lieutenant Riley, to take his calculations to some nuclear place. Yeah. That was so Get them fun. The difference in techno babble is super oh, it's fun. Deep. I love it's it. Deep. You did. Good. Oh, I love it because, like, saying nuclear yes. was a big deal. And it still is, but it's less. Like now we're like, oh my God, that in the meal 60s was it nuclear. Would be. You know? Yeah. In the 60s, it's like, that's the thing that ended the war 15 years we don't, ago. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's still too soon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, but that was really fun. But 20. It, he just has this commanding, like, scientific approach, and it's so direct. And that moment with Uhura, when we yes. see her inside the guts yes. of the machine with all of these different like a systems little sonic screwdriver <laughs> yeah and she's just in there and we we're like so close up i have such a perfect vision of how she did her eye makeup it's great i love it <laughs> yeah like, i can see the cat eye that's what you take away from that from that moment oh, it was so well. great i was like oh my god she's so fucking beautiful like she's amazing uh, her, so it's so she is so beautiful and to mm-hmm. be that close to the camera means i just have a chance to see like i don't know just this it's such a different i i saw her on top of the console because mm-hmm. she was basically like trying to fix something and she's like sitting on it i you know that's usually and who she's she is. underneath it she's in but it this time it was like that's your face it's right there and then you have like Spock's face just kind of pop in like, hey, how's it going? Hi. <laughs> She's, I'm going to need you to hurry up. And just, this is delicate jump, work. Jump. And when he said, there's no one better suited to do this work than you. Oh, it made my heart Spock, so happy. Like, just in this compassionate leadership role as well. Like this is a seasoned officer. Like he's giving encouragement at the right times. This isn't about giving us the evolution of Spock. This is a man that is doing his job as he knows to do it. And like, this is a crew that is listening to him and he knows what to say at the right time. Like, it's so fun to see Spock in that position. And I was going to mention this earlier, but it didn't slip in at the right time. That's what she said. (laughs) All of the stuff we said about Carolyn's character, it's juxtaposed by Ahura being in this engineer position where she's like i'm in the guts of the ship i'm gonna get this right and spock's like you're the perfect person for the job get it get it done and she's like i'm gonna get it done i haven't done this in a while but i'm gonna figure it out I and i'm like it. It, I, it's amazing but it breaks my brain because i'm like you knew what you were doing i'm glad it's you, there i'm really I'm, glad I'm it's so there i'm so glad it's there i want more of I it do too. It's, um, it's so strange to have the carolyn stuff with ahura just being like you're not a woman, you're a person. <laughs> After we watch Doing this episode, job. like you need to go in for a dose of Strange New Worlds because yeah. it's the old school vibe with new writing and really well thought out female characters that are allowed to be all of the things that women are. There's emotion and and there's creativity and there's directness and there's confidence and it's not overplayed. I yeah. I I also like there's a way to overswing and overcompensate but um i don't feel like that happens in strange new worlds and i miss that show because there's like a real place that in my heart watching that one because it's the most recent you know show that i've seen i mean we watched yeah. discovery and obviously there's a captain in the chair and that's nice and i did see janeway as well um but i really like how the women are portrayed in strange new worlds I don't. Yeah. I, I don't know. I'm. I kind of. It's a good balance. That, it feels like a I good miss balance. That vibe. But I was yeah. really pleased that this episode had, like you said, it. It is jarring, but to not question Uhura because Spock could have said, "Do better." He could have said, "Go faster." He could have Should said, "I get Riley to take over." Right. <laughs> like, why don't you know? He could have questioned her, but instead he says, "I trust you." By by not saying anything at all, that's him showing his support. And she does. She gets it done. Then she gets to go back down and stick the A-track player into the little Bobby Bobby machine and <laughs> push the buttons. And that's the other thing I want to talk about, please, just real quick. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Go, go, go. What do you love? All of the sounds chuck, chuck. on this yes! ship are yes! just so delightful. <laughs> this is what I've been saying. Yes. They're great. They don't just boop, boop. beep, boop, boop. They clunk, clunk, <laughs> clunk. Like, there is a depth to when... Yes. 
um, what's his name that Sulu? Sulu firing the phases. It's not just click or or when he's trying to like ramming speed. Yes, those buttons accelerate. Go backwards. Yes, I don't know where click, they click, exist click. in the real world. Like it, it's a mechanical button. Yes, like, the ultimate fidget cube. <laughs> like clonk clonk clonk, and I'm so glad that the microphone was so good in there <laughs> that we get to hear it because we can hear kirk step onto carpet with the microphone yes. so yep. those buttons were just like i was giggling and that so oh it's so great i was happy with like the funny you know scotty was down there scanning when apollo like that just cracked that was a fun humor moment but like m- i was delighted by again seeing all like the little buttons and they're just like pressing them and moving them and they have to punch them they do so hard yes. they are wedged <laughs> they're like, all of the like sulu's like all oh, phaser banks fire click 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 when the the phrase punch a button this is why like you yeah this is why like when when uh, pike says punch it it's literal <laughs> It's amazing. And I love the little white nozzle that's on Kirk's chair that's for the <laughs> communicator. And Spock was like, click! It's like a big fucking lever. I also like the evolution of the Enterprise changing this episode. Every mm. time we went back to the Enterprise, it was very evident that Spock and the crew were actively making progress on solving the mystery or solving the problem of how to do anything. Communicate was number one. We got to figure out how to communicate. And then it was fire through the hand, you know, and things were changing in that engine room or in the on the bridge. And that engine, mm-hmm. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The bridge. I'm Don't do it. Um, every single time we visited, and that was so clever because they didn't have to do a lot. You know, mm-hmm. it's just different positions. And then even the person that was sitting by Sulu, there's just a quick moment. It's a totally new, like little. Uh, I don't even know what you'd call it. Like a little mobile mm, extra console. Look, yes. Yeah. That yeah, is yeah, suddenly yeah. there, <laughs> and. Um, it's barely even like they don't even pay attention to it too much. But as Spock goes to hand his massive paperwork to the guy, he's like, hey, um, it, like Sulu turns to that person beside him. And says, like, let's let's recalibrate this or what he says something. And that's all it is. And it's just like oh, they're really trying to solve the problem. And that guy like nods and he starts to compute on his little thing. I oh, love it was that. so just believe how, how much fun is it to like build that set and then take it apart and like find <laughs> the guts of it and it just it gives you so much depth to we are on a spaceship we're not on a set we are on a working spaceship with wires that do things this ship can actually do the things that they're telling us it can do because yeah. it's such a detailed set and there's so much character to it. I love the circuit boards that it's are her. It's so fun. They, yes. they, it's such a short scene like mm-hmm. of her with her head in it. Yeah. But those circuit boards are so detailed. There's so much going on in there. It wasn't just a few flashing lights. Like I feel like it outdoes some of the stuff we see in TNG. Like there's so much wires and buttons going on in there. It's, oh, I, I love it. So it is one of my favorite things. Like when I think of TOS, the thing that brings me back is being on the enterprise and listening yeah. to the sounds yeah. and looking at how everything changes and gets moved around it is the reason i would say that i enjoyed this episode is because yeah. i get to see the crew doing interesting things like the motivation for this episode the relationship drama that kind of stuff i'm out but the way that the crew is handling a problem is interesting and that's kind of how i have to look at this is this is a problem and even kirk you know leading the away team coming up I love with the way the he next... leads in this episode i yeah. thought it was great i liked how he was like this is what we're gonna do we're gonna try this and just trying to come up with okay so if this person is actually a god this is how it makes sense and it just i believed all of that it wasn't like this was an unbelievable episode this was the kind of episode that the dialogue and the motivation of the bad guy and one of the crew members just it leaves a sour taste in your mouth but does that mean that the episode is bad no it doesn't it means it's uncomfortable and i yeah. don't think that we should shy away from uncomfortable things this is one of the reasons why i'm still open to judzia and wharf <laughs> mm-hmm. um, yeah yeah like, i've got an episode that'll kill that for you <laughs> <laughs> but kill it dead but what a what an interesting idea. You're flying through space, a giant hand stops you because a god wants you to worship them and then both right. both people are trying to figure out how to communicate. Like it was a great episode. Yeah. It it's uncomfortable, but it was great. In general, people do like this episode. Like it is yeah. among fans, it is well like kind of received. I don't know if loved is the right word, but it is and, and the, the person I would recommend this to is the com- completionist, is the person yeah. that likes TOS and 
wants to get through all of it. Like, this is one you have to watch for the green hand, for Michael Forrest. Right. And it's kind of like just we know there's some bad stuff with the with the female portrayal um, and that kind of stuff in this episode. Yeah, I think you're right. That is the answer is that when you're thinking about TOS, there's going to be certain episodes that are almost like on the must see wheel. And yeah. this is probably, you know, one of them. I wouldn't have known that because I wasn't, of course not. I, you know, I'm not aware of which ones are the most popular. But the fact that people cosplay as a ship and then have a hand somewhere oh my gosh. is so yeah. silly. And I, I adore it's incredible. that. You're wearing an Enterprise with a hand on it or there'll be it's the amazing. hand and just holding a little ship of the Enterprise. So they're in just completely <laughs> normal clothing, but they've painted their hand green and they're holding a model ship. Oh my God. <laughs> like, it would oh, be, I know what you're cosplaying as. How funny would it be if you were dressed as apollo with a green hand yes. holding a ship oh like beautiful. Go, go the next level I'm gonna get my apollo body on um there's a couple of other things i just wanted to mention this has a really great title this is a really clever yeah title. let's talk so, about what adonis means because adonis definitely didn't make an appearance in the episode nope so it's referring to um a poem uh blah, 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 a poem by percy shelley which was basically about the death of john keats and like the the crux of it is she was kind of taking shots at people who critiqued his work so this title kind of lies into that to who are we to create to critique the work of a god adonis is a metaphor for keats there's another layer to it which is really great which is um adone is the hebrew word for god oh okay. and when you stick the s on the end it's Adonis, ah. so who mourns for the gods? So it's not just who's mourning for Apollo or Adonis, it's who, who mourns for the gods in general right. now that we don't worship them anymore right. and that they aren't a part of our lives. Nobody. So it's, it's I don't really fucking care about clever. <laughs> exactly. It's really clever on a few different Ooh, levels. Oh, I'm all powerful. Ooh, how sad we are. What a shame. What a shame. You need me to worship you as well as have all your god powers? Oh. Well, that sucks. Like, how different would this episode have been if he hadn't have been so aggressive? Yeah, and they really been, like, had to kind of nice. go, we have to destroy this creature's power. Otherwise, yeah. we're going to be enslaved. But I think that would have taken two hours yeah. to develop. You know, but it's yeah. an interesting I concept. I will cure Benga's daughter. <laughs> right. <laughs> you guys Ooh, have to stay with me, right? Oh, shit. Uh-huh. Um, so the, we're not, we're before we get into the sins... How do you feel about your predictions and oh how I pulled this episode out Ugh. of what you said? The big hand killed me in the lilac dress <laughs> in the courtyard. I don't remember if I said lilac specifically, but you I, said lilac dress. Oh, that's amazing. Well, I it's incredible. I, it had everything that I saw, and even yeah, sometimes the fruit. I, uh, yeah, the damn fruit was on the table. Well, it was weird because I'm the only one that knows what I like. The, the picture in my imagination. Mm -hmm. I what I should do is I should draw some stuff and then show you so that it's like mm -hmm. proof that. But mm -hmm. um, the courtyard was really interesting because the taller trees is part mm. of what I had seen in my imagination. So I was like, wow, that's really really close. Um, and then the hand thing freaked me out. <laughs> Right, I was like a little and, like, oh and my god! That's the one. That's what you can be as cynical as you like. It was but a huge even, hand. Like <laughs> as me, that's the one. But I was like, you can't fake that because that has nothing to oh. do with Grecian garb. It's just that so, open hand pushed me over the edge. Here's what I was like. Here's what freaks me one. out is sometimes my own predictions scare me. This is one that scares me a little bit. I'm not gonna lie. But there was a moment in my imagination where I saw a really, really big hand and it was it was so big that I was like, oh, that must be like in the foreground of the shot. Like somebody yes. falls down and their hand is like really close to the camera or something like that because of the way that the hand was positioned. I just assumed that they were on their side. Mm -hmm. so, so it wasn't like exactly what this episode was. But no, but, but what was weird is that I only saw the part that we see. And so when I saw it on holding the ship. <laughs> that that's almost exactly the position of the hand that i saw in my imagination so it was really freaky and i don't know if i want to do this anymore <laughs> <laughs> we should stop we should stop doing the prediction like, game we just did one it's a one-off episode yeah we did no, a little two, experiment it was one. too much yeah. mm -hmm. i love it it's so great well before we head into scenes what are your pips i should i should use my powers for something like you should use it for something useful i should turn yes. into a god Correct. myself Yes. Um, when I run it through all the filters that I run to kind of almost excuse it from some of the messages that I feel like it might be sending that it shouldn't send. <laughs> yeah. Um. I think I think this is a three, and and here's why. I really really enjoyed the way that the crew was interacting with the enemy, and even though it was a little bit too much enemy for me, 
I think I understand why, because at the time, this would be a really interesting thought for the audience of like this Greek mythology and how maybe it was real and listening to him talk and listening to him speak, I think was important for these characters to be really believe that he was going to do harm to them because if they had cut that down i don't know that it would have been as believable like we kind of saw him be crazy from the beginning like that we gotta see him kick the shit out of scott it wasn't like they it wasn't like he started off nice apollo didn't start off nice and then and have a couple curious moments. like from the beginning he was scary and they were just trying to figure out how to get out and um I, i we got to see different characters like i don't think i usually get to see Chekhov very much so this is only the uh, he wasn't in any of season one and that's where most of our episodes have been oh, okay because it's where the best ones are um he doesn't appear until episode uh season two episode one so this is the second episode we would have seen a him 22 in. year old it was 22 year old pavel Chekhov. amazing um so fun i liked the crew you can kind of feel they're in season two and like comfortable Mm-hmm. absolutely and i liked that and i loved yep. seeing spock in the captain's chair and <sighs> how they were going about solving the problems and i i don't know I, this is one again i don't know that i would recommend it but in, but if the completionist thing is true you're going to come across it and i yeah I, you should watch i want to dock it for some of what i endured because i am a woman and some of the things that were said were like jesus christ um but I try to put that aside and kind of go, okay, this is yeah. kind of just what happens. It's like, yeah, it, it's going to sound strange considering how much we we shit upon it at the beginning. But I'm I'm with you at three. Like, I do give a lot of grace to the original series for that tropey female role stuff because a lot of it was what was wanted on TV as well, or what was perceived to be wanted on TV. A lot of the TV at the time was still damsel in distress, in distress, and. I I, I want to give some grace to the conversations that were happening at the time and what the intent was and how it hasn't aged 50 years later. Right. At the heart of it, I still really enjoy this episode. I love Michael Forrest. Uh, like you said, I love Spock on the Enterprise as well. I actually really like Kirk's leadership in this episode and how that's put together. So yeah, overall, it's a fun episode. It's just hard to recommend mainly because of that first scene with Kirk, Scotty, and McCoy. Like, that's what I would dock an entire two points just for that. Yeah, I think you start it, like, a few minutes in, and you'll be fine. Skip that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, just have her beam down as the expert. I don't even need that initial scene with Scotty. You know what it, you know what it kind of feels like is sometimes when I'll watch a show, I feel like they kind of make a joke at the beginning knowing that, like, a woman is going to be more present. So they'll do, like, a low jab joke so that Mm -hmm. if there is any tender egos out there that don't want to see a woman it's like well they already kind of like did a joke so it's okay they got they got her so now i can watch the rest of it because it's it's really out of place (sighs) and no it is yeah 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 anyway yep i think that's fair okay with that let's head over to engineering to do some sins battle stations red alert warning warp core collapse in 10 seconds this is the part of the show where we re-engage our sin brains, remind ourselves that no TV shows about sin, even our beloved Star Trek. Go for it, Ambassador. Man, my biggest sin is why they didn't just go down the lane and try to find her. Like, why did they stay at the pavilion for so long? The away yeah, team, uh-huh. when she leaves, um, it just, it, they didn't even try to, yeah. to search for her, her at all. I mean, initially, Kirk is like, if... I, I can almost imagine Kirk saying, well, if she was a man, we wouldn't be following her. And he's kind of believes that she's doing some reconnaissance and is like, she's doing her job. She'll be okay. We don't need to be overprotective. But when it gets towards the end and she's screaming in the fucking forest, I'm like, go and get her. <laughs> it's just like, we don't know where she is. Like, well, have you even tried to leave the pavilion yet? Because right? I haven't seen you leave this really interesting set that they created. Set? Yep. Yep. <laughs> Um, my biggest one is the when they have that initial uh, that initial hand grabbing and um, the Enterprise is stopped dead in its tracks and then it's McCoy I think that says we have five injuries that that is a lie because I think a dozen actual actors died in the beginning of that scene when they are launched across the bridge. I'm not even saying that the characters survived that. I'm saying that the actors that threw themselves across the bridge survived it. Like, they commit more than any other series 
to launching their bodies when that ship is under attack. Like, Picard will have, like, a bit of a chair wobble. Maybe Riker will fall down. These guys are yeeted. They are gone. There were injuries that day. I'm sure of it. Kneecaps just totally displaced. Severed arms. Concussions. Children no longer to be had. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, my next one is the, uh, you know... The show wants us to believe that Apollo, Apollo, Apollo is this like, you know, can create life, can do all of these things. Mm -hmm. But then he says to Kirk, OK, I want you to make plans to bring your crew down. It's like, well, you could do that. You come on. It, Apollo. it kind of you bring them down. took away some of his power. And maybe that's intentional. But the fact that Kirk didn't catch that or like no one yeah. caught like. You've been saying that you can do whatever you want. You can create life if you want to. So why not? If you want everybody down here, then get everybody down here. I like that he has limits, but that's my next sin as well, is that Apollo is all powerful and a god, but not really. Right. Like, he, he almost <laughs> yeah, does exactly. feel a bit too limited. He's like, I could pop you out of existence and bring you back again. Like, the amount of energy it takes to create human beings and life on a planet is big, and they exhaust it by shouting at him. And like a few lightning bolts. So it does feel a bit odd that he doesn't have more power. And maybe it's because it's more powerful if they're willing and they come down willingly. But you've tricked them into being there. Nobody's willing in this situation if that's how it works. Yeah. Um, my next one isn't necessarily a dig. because we, we, we went into a lot of the sexism already. But there was this one moment where Kirk gives his speech to Carolyn and, you know, give me your hand, feel that human flesh against human flesh were the same. And he goes on to be like, your duty lies in the rest of humanity. Do you understand that? And mm -hmm. she says, yes, sir, my orders and my duty. And then she gets up and she kind of forlornly walks away. And I kind of got stuck on that in my head for a minute and then I had to like put it out of my brain because I was watching the, the show. But it's a really interesting idea that, um, you know, women and men too, but people are mm -hmm. sometimes told to put aside their desires because they have a duty and a responsibility to something bigger. Yeah. And if we're talking about that being a powerful statement for a woman, it might be that, well, she's a scientist. She is a professional. She has a desire of her own and she's having to put that aside to become a goddess but that's not what the show went for it no. went for her having this sad puppy dog walk away when she realized that she couldn't be a dominating goddess yeah. <laughs> and i just like that line my orders and my duty could be so powerful out of the words yeah. of a woman if it was the other choice but it wasn't. It was the. Nope. It was that she couldn't fall in love with Apollo, and I'm. I just want to sin that moment. I'm with you, and that that ties into Kirk's argument just not being very convincing for me. Like it's a pretty weak speech in terms of captain speeches for me. It relies on you're a human. Don't betray your humans. And there's so many angles to come at that from. You don't have to specify human versus God. Like that doesn't have to come into it. It's right versus wrong. And it's the lives of 150 versus your sudden and inexplicable uh, love for this person. So, yeah, it, it, it's a very frustrating Kirk speech for me. Yeah, yeah. It, it had a, it has like a ring true to it somewhere, but it's kind of like this. It sounds great. It's like, but when wow, you dig into wait. it. <laughs> wait. Wait. What are we saying You're saying here? that passionately, but that doesn't mean it's right. You're saying it with conviction, but I don't buy it. Um, Chekhov, just to get right into a silly sin, Chekhov does some incredibly terrible tricordering. Oh. Did you see him? When I, if you've watched this episode, go back and rewatch this scene. When they beam down to Pablos 4, whatever it's called, Pollux 4, he whips out his tricorder, and you can tell it's the first time the actor, Walter Koenig, has ever used this before. He's just like waving it up and down, left to right. He's going crazy with this thing. No readings are being taken. He's just waving it. And then when you pan over to Scotty, he's using it correctly because he's been doing this for over a year. Just very still, just slight movements. And Chekhov is just like oh, yeeting this thing up and down. Uh, use your toys properly. Yeah. It was fun. I, I really like watching Kirk use the tricorder thingy, whatever oh, it is. The, the communicator so every fun. time. I love it. 
and then change hands, wiggle with the other nipple. It's so great. And then flip it and back he down. He has to tuck it in his ass crack. It's perfect. He broke He broke so many I'm of those. Sure. He violently flip it open. Well, yeah, they actually make a joke about it in one of the Star Trek movies. Oh, really? Yeah, Chris Pine um, flips it open and the, the lid <laughs> flies off into the distance. <laughs> <laughs> and he's because it's broken. Oh, my God. That's amazing. Oh, that's so good. Um, I Scotty has some interesting character choices in this episode. He just like shoots Apollo. Like it just he takes mild offense at Carolyn being taken away and draws a gun on the alien and just fires. Mm-hmm. Comes at him with a fucking candelabra. Like after being told not to. After being told not to do it. Like Scotty is unhinged in this episode. He's, His boner is real. He really wants to go have coffee, okay? He needs that coffee. I think he's had too much coffee. My next one is um, when they destroy the pavilion and everything mm. kind of calms down, they don't just immediately beam the fuck out of there. Oh, S- Spock should be beam them up as soon as they can. It should be the first thing. But instead, they kind of want to see like, okay, how much damage did we do to you emotionally? <laughs> yeah, right. I don't know. There's just... Let's check on that first. Y- you don't know. Maybe there's a backup power reserve. This is your one shot to get out of there. Now... I realized that we wouldn't then get to see Apollo crying and that was how they wanted to end this episode. But how much better would it be if they did that from the bridge and they all teleported or beamed, transported. Yeah, he could have done it on the view screen. Back on, yeah, get it on the view screen and all the crew is just like, hey, Carolyn, what's going on with your garb there, babe? Yeah, what what happened? I fell in love with an alien and I can't go live my life and be a goddess and have slaves. (laughs) You were gone for 59 minutes. <laughs> oh, okay. Oops. Uh, this is such a dumb scene, but to- Apollo's tiny nipple has always distracted me, even when I was so a kid. So tiny. A tiny nipple that I think they've like put foundation over. So that it, it mean, Probably it like may a tanning well be, thing, maybe? Yeah, it may just be a tanning. It may just be how Michael Forrest is. I'll never know. I mean, I might never know, but it looks like it's been blended in. And it was always very distracting to me that his nipple wasn't very visible and was very tiny. Um, wow. But, yeah. You know, some people's nipples just don't look like yours, Ian. <laughs> I'm, no, I think everything should look like me. Um, but yeah, always distracted me. And that's just the 10-year-old Ian that wants to share a sin that he wrote a long, there long time go. ago. There you go. And there you go. But he is a specimen of a man. He's a, a beautiful, beautiful man. Apollo's tiny nipple should have been the title of this episode. <laughs> that that really should be it. <laughs> I was really bummed that I didn't get to see, I think this is my final sin, was the men not being in garb as well. Well, it's interesting you say that. There is another episode that is Grecian in theme, and I, I believe they do get dressed up in that episode. That is not an episode we will be watching. Okay. Is it- <laughs> I was so glad you said Big Hand, because it steered me away from that episode and into this one. Okay. Yeah. Um, my last sin is that Spock's resolution is to blow it up. I just, I would love there to be a more Star Trek-y ending to this. As much as I love that finale and the tension and the drama and the music and it's, stop, it's great. Blow it up is a pretty not Star Trek way to end the episode. It's, let's just destroy the power source. So it's it's a little bit, I love the climax, but it's thematically anticlimactic. Yeah. I wish there would have been more of a, of a point made about Spock slash Pan really making a shit <laughs> yeah. life for apollo right i wish he'd beamed down and just like ruined him yeah if he beamed down and then just flipped him off yeah <laughs> that would be amazing <laughs> i want to see spock flip someone off so bad <laughs> do you have anything to say to that spock we have to have it like that's a racist sin in this one too for apollo just being like you're not oh, invited yeah. don't bring the one with the pointy ears because he's much like pan and pan bored me no sad faces <laughs> <laughs> that's racist no sad faces so serious Okay, with that, um, I'm glad we watched that episode. That was that gave us so much to talk about. That was so so interesting. I don't know that it's one that I would have ever picked, which is why this, uh, the way that we're do- picking the episodes at the minute is so much fun because we're getting some really interesting stuff happen. Um, and with that, let's dive into Danae's brain and pick another one <laughs> if she's prepared. Oh no, I'm scared. Accessing library computer data. I mind to your mind. Vulcans never bluff. Okay, crew, it's time to test my trekdom as we dive into today's brain for next week's episode. Ambassador, do I give you a prompt again? Um, okay, I'm going to give you something and then maybe you give me something. Okay, okay. Okay. Yep. 
Okay, the first thing I see, it's very clearly a TNG. Now, this doesn't mean we have to pick TNG, but I'm just going to tell you like what I'm seeing. The style, okay. Yeah. Um, and it's like whenever they're trying to explain what's going on in space, and so they're you're, you're looking at the panel on the wall. Okay. Okay. And and the visual is top. We're like looking at it from above down, and then it shifts. We're looking at it from the side, and it appears to be like a spiral going down, like a whirlpool from the top, and then it shifts down, and it looks more like a like a little tornado. But it's on the TNG screen. As if like the, there's a ship, maybe it's going to fly into it or they're like evaluating something. And so that's the first thing I see. Mm. Yeah, they're scanning something and something's out there in space. And when you look at it from above, it's like a circle. And then when you look at it from the side, it looks like a vortex. Oh, God. OK, let me let me do a bit of let me do a bit of Googling. Is there only one option at this point? Like, is There's that- only one option. There's only one option that I can think of. I can't remember exactly if this happens on like the TNG screen. Yeah. But what you've described of the Enterprise... It feels like it's like going into something or getting yeah, sucked going, into something. Yeah, that image, I just did some Googling to confirm the image I was thinking of existed. And it is in the episode that I'm thinking of. It is the Enterprise going down into a vortex. Now, I can't... I know they talk about it in the conference room. I don't yeah. know if Geordie brings up a visual of it or not. I think oh, okay. he does. That's okay. That's but okay. it's 100% it's- uh spirally tornado thing next week's episode is going to be time squared um which just happens to be one of my favorite really yeah oh that's fun okay okay this is season two episode 13 uh time squared this is genuinely one of my favorites this is a fun um an episode we almost picked i almost picked for the time travel series but we just we it's not like top tier but personally there's so much in this episode that I love, and it's going to be a great conversation starter as well. So yeah, next week's episode, based on the, the based on the prompt that today has pulled from my brain, will be Time Squared. Um, yeah, that's fun. Any any further thoughts now that I've given you the the title? Well, I feel like it's really difficult for me to do any predictions at this point because I no TNG so mm. like I can't be like I see a mammoth visor <laughs> you know what I mean just, yeah, there's gonna be a Klingon and they're going to ignore him <laughs> I'm kind of relieved that I don't have anything super specific because I freaked myself out so I like that I just had like one idea and then we're just going with there's it there's one image that's gonna that's freak it. you out I guarantee it it may oh, not no. be on like I mean if it happens to be on the view screen I can't remember like on like the on the conference room screen that will freak you out but even when you see this image when it actually happens to the enterprise i think it will it'll freak you out and i know we haven't we haven't seen this episode together so that's amazing um okay love that next week's episode time squared season two episode 13 thank you for joining us this week um we hope you had a blast apologies if you hated the episode <laughs> <laughs> I'm, well, I'm sure you love the show instead right yes yeah. of course yeah that's it Send any emails, anything you want us to, to mention on the show, uh, captainspod at cinemasins.com. Join, dot com. join all of the lovely Star Trekkies that we have in the Cinemasins world at discord.gg slash cinemasins. And until next week, I'm Captain Ian, and I can think of no one better suited for the job than you, Miss Ahura. Aww. I, I believe before we even talked about that, that was my end quote. And it's insults are effective only where emotion is present. I love me. it. That's so you. I love it. Live long and podsper. Thanks for listening. Want to connect with the show? Our hailing frequencies are always open through captainspod at cinemasins.com. Like, comment, and subscribe on your podcast player of choice, and be sure to visit cinemasins.com. Hello. Hello. Hi. What are do? I was watching shorts because I have I too. a brain problem. <laughs> I have a brain problem too. <laughs> I now have to watch shorts. And I'm trying to, whenever an ad comes up, come out of the app. I'm trying to train the algorithm to not send me ads. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Good Hey, luck. he quits whenever an advert comes on. Stop yeah. sending him adverts. No, I think they'll just get more clever with it. When you yeah. do something else, send him one with boobs. Well, you, you know me so well. That's that'll keep me on on the TikTok. I had a male friend who was off of Instagram for a long time and decided to restart his Instagram. Mm. And when he started his Instagram, the first thing that he got was a an entire genre of women who are like breastfeeding, pretend babies, 
so they okay. can show their boobs. Right. Okay. Yeah, I see it. Yeah. And he was like, I don't know how. Why was that the number Instagram one? Instagram decided that this is where I need to restart. He my, took the mailbox. That's yeah. That's all he did. It's like you're yeah. a male, so let's show you some tits. Immediate but, boobs. And, and the best way to do that is ones that are breastfeeding a baby, because the algorithm sees the pretend baby and thinks that it's like, well, they're breastfeeding, so it's okay. I don't. But then if, but if you click their profile, you know they're like, you know, making their money on OnlyFans. <laughs> it's not, and they're it's creating, I'm sure, a very confusing problem. Yeah. Uh huh. This is how that's Homelander an, got his issues. Yeah, exactly. That's an interesting pathway that we're allowing to be created oh gosh i was gonna say do we want to talk about how the goat has become a legend in yeah the, we in should the town? yeah we absolutely should give a little update there <laughs> uh-huh we have a little update about the the land and the goat that i let free my favorite part of learning this update we were having lunch with my homesteading friends who came to came to the city mm, they did come to the city that sounds so patronizing they they yeah. they've lived in cities before they they know the city <laughs> Well, yeah, they know the city, but they don't like it. <laughs> no, I don't like it. <laughs> but there's there's a uh, big bags of cat food in the city. <laughs> yeah, there is at discount prices. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I loved meeting up with them for lunch, and they asked about my wound if it was healing mm. correctly, and I I still have like evidence, yeah. strong evidence on, on my epidermis. skin. Yeah, yeah, it has definitely not fully healed. Mm-hmm. I, I have a red i don't know if it's gonna scar but it's still healing for sure and i was talking about how i um feel like an epic like i had an epic moment and i Mm. went from city girl to one badge on the farm girl i got one badge yeah and it felt epic and they said yeah you want to know how epic it was we went to the how did they word it we went to the um gas station which in a small town is like Mm -hmm. the hub of activity it's the one yeah (laughs) and they're talking to the clerk, who was one of their friends. It's like, hey, sorry we didn't get to see you at the barbecue. And the and the gas station attendant said, oh, man, I heard it was so great. Like, it was a great barbecue. And then behind them is this old man with his beer. Who they did not know. They did not know. Who said, oh, are you guys the ones that had that great barbecue where the goat got out? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh no it is the talk of the town it is. everyone knew they were so emphatic They're like danae everyone in the town knows about the goat they know about Just the goat overnight. getting out i know how it happened because i imagine it's the the guy that brought them the two goats right that they purchased it from yes of course he's going to share that story it gets of shared course. again and again and again eventually it hits the entire population of 14 people and you become <laughs> a legend <laughs> Yeah, let's just put it into context. We're not talking about a town that's like five thousand people. No, this is a small. In fact, I'm gonna look up the yeah how the population of guess, the city. I'm gonna guess three thousand two hundred and five. Oh, you think so? Yes. I'm thinking it's more like five hundred. Oh, oh, okay, cool. Not quite in the dozens, but under a thousand. Okay, let's take a look. <laughs> okay, in 2022. Oh no. Nine hundred nineteen <gasps> people. Oh, I was way off. <laughs> wow, that does, why does that place have a name? <laughs> <laughs> I think if you if you have a post office, I think you have a name. <laughs> that's more important than the people. I think that's kind of how, yeah. how it how That's it works. amazing. So we are we are statistically we are known among the 900 people as the yeah. ones that let the goat out. We have not been famous before this story. Nope. It's amazing. That's an that that is a lower circulation than our podcast. <laughs> More people by, by listen to our podcast than live in this yes. this little this little town. <laughs> That's amazing. There, there was one other thing as well. We should probably give an update about the hammock that we left behind. Okay, first of all, there's a couple of things about these stories that I feel like I just need, even if it's just, just between me and you, I guess. Okay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You were not 100% responsible for the goat getting out. I wasn't. I you wasn't. Weren't. I was you not. You are not also no. not responsible for the hammock. Not even close. Causing children to be injured. Nope. Not even that close it, to being my fault. We left it there, but it still needs to be maintained and checked by the people. That- and used properly, which I guarantee it was not being used <laughs> properly. <laughs> We did not use it properly the first time. We no. are such city folk. You swung me on it. That's why I <laughs> fell out. And I guarantee that's what happened. There were four kids and they swang. There's no way that that thing had four kids in it and no swinging happens. Kids swing on stationary park benches. So there's no way a hammock. That was way too tempting. 
I don't think you're wrong. I, I'm learned... imagining like 360, like complete swings. We learned some valuable lessons mm. that day. Move rocks. Just about the hammock. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I've never thought of it before. Oh my gosh. I just got a hammock. I saw that it was on sale <laughs> yeah. for like Walmart. I was like, you know what? Sure. I'll take a hammock. Great with contribution me. to the land. Genuinely. There, is, there are is. trees. Yeah. That we can do that. Mm-hmm. So we go to set it up and obviously fail. You fall. Mm hmm narrowly miss a rock in my ass and it was upon reflection that we realized that the first thing besides finding the great spot i guess so find your great spot but then also clear the debris yeah. underneath the hammock mm-hmm. we, we we i didn't know that i've never, never, I, I've never thought about that right. before I'm city folk we don't need hammocks we're gonna tie it between two lamp posts street lamps sorry <laughs> but yeah we we were informed that the second that they turned up um the children? The, no, no, no. The uh, your the the homesteading friends who oh, are yes. renaming an, renaming anonymous, remaining anonymous. And um, the first thing um, he said was, <laughs> "Ian, I need to talk to you about your hammock attaching skills and how it nearly killed a child." Oh man! <sighs> yeah. So a, a child did uh, the, the hammock collapsed while there were children in it, and, a- and said the child, child fell onto fell on a, a sharp rock. Rock. Yeah. Yeah. And then the three siblings fell on the child that was already yeah. on the hard rock. So it was it was not great. In it reminded leg. me in the leg, not like the head or like kidney or something. No, because he was laughing leg, about it, so it wasn't was okay. super serious. Yeah. Yeah, All yeah, the kids yeah, yeah. are fine. No, no kids were harmed in the making of this hammer. But I'm sure you were blamed for it in the moment. I'm sure it's like, well, the Englishman set it up. So well, yeah, what does he know? I'm sure the entire town knows about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're the guy that nearly killed that kid. Nine hundred some people. They all know. Yeah. Know that you can't be trusted with just about anything. I can. It's hammocks don't not do not like lateral movement. They don't. They go up and down. They don't like being side to side unless they're designed to do well, that. To which be I don't fair, know how to do. We really did not tie it very intently. No, I did. Hundred percent. You didn't have anything to do with it. I, I did. <laughs> you had no, You didn't go. Near I walked these away. Knots. You left. I was the, like, oh. After it fell. Then I changed the knots and I found tree nubbins for it to clamp down onto. And then I even adjusted it so that there was an incline so that the blood didn't run away from our feet. Because <laughs> I got wow. in there and I started getting pins and needles because my legs were too elevated. <laughs> oh, the problems with going out in nature. <sighs> That's why you don't. Don't do it. Stay in and listen to podcasts and watch Star Trek people. Okay, let's do it. Ready. Captain Spot, date 156144. Ooh, nope, because we were going to record on Friday, and it is now not Friday anymore. It is Monday. Captain Spot, start eight fifteen. Si- <coughs> oh my god! Wow, <coughs> my cough is not wow. gone yet. Wow. Uh huh. Touch me, touch me, touch me. <laughs> that, touch me, touch me, touch me. <laughs> that needs explain explaining. Touch me, touch me, touch me. That needs explaining, Danae. That's the animal song. Touch me, touch me, touch me. Started with a cat. Mm-hmm. And that's now the dog song. And when they want to have pets, that's what they sing to me in my imagination. <laughs> and now touch Iris... me, touch me, touch me. And now touch Iris... me, touch me, touch me. <laughs> and now Iris actually sings it to you. Yes, she does. Did you realize that you... I love it when you do this. You accidentally quote a movie no. almost perfectly. You just quoted um, the bad guy, Bison, from Street Fighter. Like, almost word for word. It was what, so great. What do you mean? What did so, I say? There's a character that um, I think, I can't remember which character it is, but she basically says, you came through my village, you destroyed my life, you killed my family, and that's why I'm so angry at you. And his response is, for you, the day I graced your village was the most important day of your life. But for me, it was Tuesday. It was a Tuesday. Yes. And you just love all the days of the week. You picked Tuesday. That was amazing. Tuesday seems to be one of the most bland days. Yeah, it's one of the most meh days. It doesn't have like the drama Thurs- of being Monday. Thursday is too exciting because yeah. Friday is coming up. Yeah. So Tuesday seems to be like the easy. Yeah. Nothing happens on a Tuesday. To me, it was Tuesday. I love that. <laughs> TOS mm. beam. T- T- oh, no. Stop it. Yeah, no, I'll do it. I really like the TOS beaming oh the one that lasts seven days the one that lasts yeah seven minutes from the cage okay listen if we're gonna be beaming tos style let me go ahead and get my knitting so that i can finish this fucking sweater before we get to wherever we're going yeah (laughs) it's so great it's so it's it's it was such an event it was such an event to have them beam down i don't like the discovery tap tap shing it's over so quick says the man who watches shorts all the time shut up (laughs) 
I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's one, right that I watch shorts. One was in the air where it's like, ooh, a knob is twisting. And in, in the new era, it's just like, let's just fucking go. Yep, ching, ching, ding. <laughs> Gone. Let's go already. How does this sound like the future? It's quicker. It's quicker. <laughs> what? Hi. <laughs> Look in your viewer. What the hell is that? That is a giant hand. What the fuck? 